Good evening. You will remember that last week we started on the two major premises, principles rather, which are unique to the message of the infinite way and upon which the healing principles are established. As you know, the subject of spiritual healing is a broad one, and these days it includes not only spiritual healing, mental healing, psychological healing, faith healing, all of these nowadays are embraced under the same title as spiritual healing. It is natural that this should be so, because when uh, metaphysical healing was introduced to the world, it was first introduced as mind healing, which certainly signifies mental healing. And then later on, the word mind became divine mind with a capital M, and it became a synonym for spirit. And so divine mind healing and spiritual healing are now one, yet really meaning mental healing and spiritual healing. Eventually, mental healing and spiritual healing became so mixed that all metaphysical healing was a combination of the mental and the spiritual. There is no exact dividing line in metaphysical healing between the mental and the spiritual because you will find in the literature of healing work that the mental argument, the activity of the mind, enters into spiritual healing as well as spirit itself. Later, <clears throat> when the idea of spiritual healing started to get popular, the evangelical healers, who were more or less known as faith healers, also adopted the term spiritual healing, which was their right because they were working with the Bible, they were working with prayer, and so they were fully entitled to the use of the term spiritual healing. And then another form of healing sprung up, which is spiritualistic healing, that is healing by mediums who have contact with individuals who have passed on. There's a, quite a good deal of that in the United States, but even more so in England. But spiritualistic healing lost uh, its end and also is known as spiritual healing. And so, when you hear that term spiritual healing, do not jump to the conclusion that you know exactly what is meant, because there is no way of your knowing what is meant except by learning who it is that says it. 
Now, <clears throat> this was well illustrated in England when the Church of England set up a committee to investigate for five years the subject of spiritual healing and then to make a report on it. And last July they made that report. And in it, they had the evidence that was given by faith healers, evangelical healers, spiritualistic healers, mental healers, Christian science healers, unity healers. And strangely enough, they bulked it all under one heading, spiritual healing. Now, as you come to the message of the infinite way, you also hear that same term, spiritual healing. And we mean something far different than many of those other teachings because the spiritual healing of which we speak is a healing based on certain specific principles. Principles of the infinite way. And therefore, we have no more right to the term spiritual healing than these others. Yet we have the same right that they have. But don't you be misled into believing that all metaphysical healing or all healing that is not physical is spiritual healing according to the principles of the infinite way. And therefore, and that is why we're having this work for this next six months. It is necessary if you wish to avail yourselves of infinite way healing, that you understand the principles upon which this is based, and not to try to bring into it those principles which you may have learned in some other metaphysical teaching. Because all you can do is bring confusion to yourself. Remember that this does not mean right or wrong. This is in no wise saying that the infinite way healing method is right and the others are wrong. This is definitely saying that infinite way healing principles differ from those of any other metaphysical teaching. Now, if you have not discerned that, and if you have not discerned what the specific infinite way principles are, this is a good time to make a start. And those of our students who have been with us some years and have not yet entirely separated themselves from other forms of healing need not wonder if they do not get the results they seek. Now, <clears throat> truthfully, I had no idea at all that our students weren't completely aware of the fact that infinite way healing principles differed from the others, nor did I realize how many of them did not know what these infinite way principles are. And uh, it was through the unfoldment that came to me after our return from Holland that it was given to me to spend these next months making this point clear. Now remember, spiritual living is quite a different subject from spiritual healing. Spiritual living is something that has been known to the mystics of all ages. There are 
European mystics, Oriental mystics, mystics from many, many parts of the world who can reveal to you all of the secrets of spiritual living because they all agree there's no difference whatsoever in spiritual life as it is presented by one mystic than spiritual life as it is presented by another except of course the matter of language but the basic principles are the same and uh, that means this that the spiritual life is lived after one has made contact or come into conscious union with God, with a source of being. Spiritual life can be lived as a student, as a seeker, by following the rules laid down by mystics. But the life itself begins when conscious union has been attained. So there is no difference of opinion on that score anywhere at all on the face of the globe. When it comes to the subject of healing, you have something entirely different. Probably throughout all time, there have been people who have attained that mystical experience, that touch of the Christ or conscious union with God, and uh, felt an influence working in them that healed. You have it all through the Bible. Moses did some healing work. Elijah did some healing work. Jesus, of course, was the greatest master of healing. In very few cases do you learn from any of the Bible characters any principle by which they healed. Actually, it was more or less that the Spirit of God had touched them, and as Jesus said, I am ordained to heal the sick. Even after that time, and all through the uh, years up to the present, there have been some few people receive the same healing gift of God. They did not necessarily know what the principle was. And therefore, they were unable to teach it. They could do beautiful healing work, but they were unable to leave any students to carry on that work or to teach that work. Then, <clears throat> in the middle of the last century, when uh, metaphysical work, metaphysical healing work, began as a general practice, it really started on almost hypnotic lines and gradually settled down into a form of uh, suggestion. It was really mental suggestion healing. You are well, you are spiritual, you are perfect. You are in the kingdom of God. You are about your father's business. Always somebody is projecting into your thought ideas of health and harmony and good. And eventually, the mind yields and you feel better. And sometimes it is a complete healing and sometimes it isn't. This is the form that metaphysical healing originally took. 
And as it spread out into the wider field of new thought, that was the pattern that was accepted. And in most cases, still is. In uh, Christian science, Mrs. Eddy made great strides in spiritual understanding and eventually came to have a tremendous spiritual contact and began the subject of spiritual healing. That is, healing without mental argument, healing without using the mind And probably this was the first introduction into the world of that form of spiritual healing which had some measure of principle behind it because the principle she taught was that God was the only cause and the only creator and therefore there could be no effect from any other cause. So the basis of her spiritual healing was the absolute allness, omnipresence of God. Now, <clears throat> my entrance into the spiritual healing work was through a spiritual experience and at a time when I knew nothing of any principle of healing or any method of healing. And so I was in the healing work for quite a long time without knowing how it happened or why, or why above all people I should have been given that particular gift. But study, prayer, revelation brought into my experience some principles which have been glimpsed here and there by different ones but never brought together as a specific healing principle. And it is for this reason that we have a message of the infinite way with specific healing principles and of course with a sufficient degree of success that has enabled this message to go around the world, find acceptance without any promotion, without any advertising, without any organization, without any financing, merely on the word of mouth advertising of those people who have been healed or benefited enough to warrant them speaking of it. Now, we have no organization and as long as I sit on this platform we never will have one and I do hope that all those who follow me will have the courage not to permit anyone else to form one because unless an individual is absolutely free to take this principle into their own consciousness and work with it, they will lose it. The very moment this becomes organized, if God forbid it ever does, be assured that you are within 20 years of losing the healing principle. And the reason is that in every organization there are some authorities. And instead of going into your own consciousness, taking the books themselves there for guidance, it becomes so easy to ask your neighbor, what about this or give me some lessons and then you have something which is not from the source. That is what has happened before, that is what can happen again. Now, 
the first of these principles has to do with the nature of God. And last week, our entire hour was devoted to that subject, and you will find it on the first side of this tape that is being made tonight, because this tape will embrace these two principles. Spiritual healing, which means healing that has something to do with God, cannot come to an individual unless they know enough of the nature of God to be able to relax and not ask God for anything or expect anything of God beyond what God is already doing. Certainly, spiritual healing can only come when uh, an individual is no longer attempting to influence God in anyone's behalf, even their own. All of this you have on the other side of this tape. Therefore, we will go into the second part of this healing principle, which if you know that first one, the second one becomes the most important. Without understanding the first one, the second one isn't reasonable or intelligible. This has to do with the subject that we call the nature of error or the nature of evil. In the infinite way, you do not use truth to overcome error. You do not expect God to heal disease or reform sin. Or to exchange lack for abundance. God, when you understand God, is already performing its functions. God is eternally bringing forth the cattle on a thousand hills, the crops in the ground, the iron, the gold, the silver, the copper, the oil, and all of the things that not only are needed today, but which will ever be needed. I remember recently one of our students bringing to my attention a passage in Encyclopedia Britannica. Speaking of a certain mountain which was uh, abundant in uranium, a worthless metal. That's the way it's read in the encyclopedia, a worthless metal, uranium. Humans may have had no value or set no value upon uranium, and therefore might have wondered how an all-infinite, intelligent God wasted time placing uranium in the ground. And you know, there was a time when oil was in the ground too, and it also was useless and valueless. According to the estimates of man, so we are going to learn that <clears throat> abundance of everything has been provided not only 
for the Ancient of Ancients, and not only for us here today, but for all those who may ever come hereafter. And that process is a continuous one. God does not stop the activity of the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, the tides, the birds in the air, or the fish in the sea. And therefore, the activity of God must be understood as a permanent dispensation, as omnipresent, here and now, throughout all time, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And then that will relieve that mental strain of trying to get in touch with God for some reason. The mind can relax with the realization, thank you, Father, God is. And all that God is, is. And all that God intends to be, is. Therefore, let us not waste time in trying to reach God for any purpose, since God already is closer to us than breathing and nearer than hands and feet, and our own Master has assured us, He knoweth your need before you do. And it is His good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, when an individual sits back and relaxes and rests in that assurance, they are bringing spiritual good, spiritual harmony into their experience. And that spiritual harmony appears in due order in the form necessary to our experience. Let us see how that works. Let us also see how, by not understanding principles, merely understanding statements of truth or taking statements of truth out of their context, how you can lose your whole demonstration. Here is the question. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. And the question is, isn't that conflicting? Meaning conflicting with our teaching. Of course not. <clears throat> Of course not, if you know the teaching, if you know the principles, if you only know a few quotations taken helter-skelter out of the message, of course it's conflicting. But when you understand that this message says that very thing, that in opening your consciousness to the presence of God, you will be fulfilled And you know right well that God is spirit. So there is no use of opening yourself to anything except that of a spiritual nature. You have already been told in the message not to take thought for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. Then there is no conflict. In fact, it is the principle itself. When you sit in quiet, peace, calmness, assurance, realizing that God is forever pouring itself into visible manifestation. All you're doing then is asking, Father, reveal thyself to me. Father, reveal thy grace. Thy grace is my sufficiency and as long as you are resting in the assurance that this is already being done you are not asking God to do it you're not begging God to start a program today but you are relaxed you're relaxed in the same way that if you want sunshine you go out of doors and just stretch yourself and you find yourself 
flooded, covered, surrounded with sunshine. When you want to be wet, you can jump into the ocean or into your tub and immediately find yourself surrounded with water. You don't have to ask, beg, plead. It's all here and it's all present where I am in your consciousness, closer to you than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. And in the realization of that, you begin to demonstrate it. And this, I tell you, is spiritual living. And it leads to the actual conscious contact or union with God. Now, in that same way then, once you understand that principle of God's omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience, once you understand that principle of God as forever being, forever flowing, ever appearing, nothing left except to relax in that grace. Now, when it comes to spiritual healing, you have to go a step further. And that is where this specific principle of the infinite way comes into expression, activity, manifestation, or demonstration. <clears throat> In the churches, they have a word, devil, or Satan, which is the impersonal source of evil. In most metaphysical teachings, they have mortal mind, also the source, the impersonal source of evil. The mistake of old was accepting the devil or Satan as the opposite of God, a power which God was always fighting and never quite defeating. To this day, that battle between God and devil goes on in orthodox teachings. And so far, the devil is far, far ahead with a little possibility that God can catch up. The reason for the failure is that devil or Satan is the impersonal source of all the evil that ever tempts man, but it isn't a power. It never is more than a temptation, a suggestion, an appearance which we have been taught to fall for, to fight, to argue. It comes down to us from the old Hebrew Testament where they appealed to this Jehovah God to defeat their enemies. Always, always, the Hebrews of old were turning to this great God of theirs to help them defeat the enemies. And sometimes God did. Sometimes he didn't. And you know, we learn that often when God didn't defeat the enemy, the reason was that the Hebrews had carelessly lost their ark in which was uh, the Ten Commandments, the Holy Writings. And if they ever lost those, they lost the battle or the war because God was not on their side when they lost that ark. Superstition, of course, but remember, we're talking about the days of ignorance, illiteracy, when perhaps not one person in a thousand knew how to read or write. No wonder there was ignorance. No wonder there was superstition.
when uh, the master came he changed that entire aspect of religion but unfortunately the churches couldn't accept it he brought to light the God of love the God who never punishes the God whom you can't implore to destroy your enemy not even when he was facing death himself did he ask God to destroy an enemy ah no he asked God to forgive the very enemy that was accountable for it you see the Hebrews didn't have the right concept of God Jesus Christ came with it and it couldn't be accepted and so from that day to this you still have the world praying to God to destroy our enemies you still have God you're praying to God to destroy our diseases which are also enemies praying to God to destroy our sins also our enemies sin hasn't lessened I don't think disease has either some forms have and then other new forms have come forth now <clears throat> when we came to the metaphysical world it was at first revealed that this mortal mind was not a power it wasn't a power and therefore if you recognized that any form of evil any form was only a part or an activity or a substance of that mortal mind and then dropped it that healing would follow and very quickly that vision was lost because the term mortal mind became exactly what it did to Paul of old who called it carnal mind and just as Paul, Paul fought it until it killed him so did the metaphysicians begin to fight mortal mind and to protect themselves from mortal mind and to try to walk on the other side of the street whenever they recognized it in some form and so to this day wherever you find a metaphysician fighting mortal mind warring against it battling it trying to overcome it or protect themselves you are witnessing a metaphysician who must fail in the same way it was brought to light in these early days of the metaphysical world that there are specific mental causes for specific physical problems now <clears throat> again Mrs. Eddy accepted that in her early days and then later realized that there wasn't a word of truth in it and she eliminated it from her teaching to the best that she could but unfortunately one of her students one of those close to her refused to accept her new revelation and published a book containing all of these mental causes for physical effects and incidentally that list has become the foundation of a new medical profession called psychosomatic medicine they have the identical list of course their work is just as much of a failure as the work of all metaphysicians who believe that there is a specific mental cause for a specific physical disease and that is why students who come to the infinite way and do not realize 
that none of that plays a part in our work. None of that plays a part in the principle through which we work. They lose the opportunity to benefit by the principles that have been revealed to me and have been found successful. Now, take this next step with me. Regardless of the name or nature of the particular discord that confronts you, whether for yourself or your patients or your family, whether it is some form of sin or disease or lack or limitation, regardless of what form it is or nature, please remember it has its basis in an impersonal call it carnal mind or mortal mind if you like or devil or Satan give it any name you like as long as you understand it to be an impersonal source And then take the next step and realize since God didn't create that source, it has no law. It has no life, it has no cause, no substance, no activity, no avenue, no channel of expression. In other words, it is a nothingness. It is exactly what Hezekiah called it, the arm of flesh. Don't go out to battle it. Just sit here. And they did, and they rested in his word, and then the enemy destroyed itself. Somewhere else in the scripture it's called the fleshly mind. The fleshly mind that is not of God. Therefore it has no God power, no God ordination, no God substance, no God activity. Again, a nothingness. Now, this enables you to withdraw from the battle so that you do not fight evil but you come into the Sermon on the Mount resist not evil turn the other cheek put up thy sword the moment that you can come into the presence of any form of evil with a relaxed mind a mind that isn't going to jump right up and start battling it and denying it, you are ready to see it dissolve into its nothingness. But if you put up your mental sword and try to deny, to argue, to overcome, the minute you try to think of truth to meet it with, you're lost you're lost the way to approach any and every form of evil is with a realization the cause causeless an appearance an impersonal source of no power then you will find that you are working with the principle of the infinite way for this is the healing principle of the message of the infinite way we do not have a truth that overcomes your errors we do not have a God that will reform you or heal you we do not have a God that will support you or supply you the God of the infinite way is already maintaining and sustaining your spiritual perfection. And all you have to do is to awaken from this belief in two powers and begin to honor God by respecting the first commandment. Thou shall have no other God Thou shalt acknowledge no other powers. How can you fear an evil power if there is only one power 
and that one power is God. It is only in the honoring of that first commandment that you can begin to perceive the healing principle of the infinite way. And of course, the second commandment of the Master is equally important. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And here is where you must take your departure from all other forms of metaphysics. You must never ascribe any form or phase of error to any individual on the face of the earth. It is a mortal sin to say of another that they are sick or that they're sinful or that they're poor or that there is anything wrong with them under the sun. Even to believe in them as mortals or human beings separates you from loving your neighbor as yourself because you do know that you are the offspring of God. You do know that I and the Father are one, and all that God is I am, and all that the Father hath is mine. You know this is true of you, but you violate the second commandment of the Master when you say, your jealousy is doing this to you, or you aren't grateful enough, or you are too resentful. Every time you use that word, you, negatively, you are violating that commandment of loving thy neighbor as thyself. That doesn't take away from you your human judgment in the sense that you understand that there are some of us not fully showing forth that which we are. That is why you make a choice of your religious teachings or your religious teacher you even make a choice of candidates when you go to the polls not because you are malpracticing anyone because you know the truth about them there isn't and never has been an individual on the face of the globe that wasn't the pure manifestation of God but you also know that there are those who have no interest in accepting that estimate of themselves. And so when you're choosing your friends or when you're choosing your teachers or when you're choosing your elected officers, you have the right to be led to those who most nearly represent in your mind the spiritual ideal. And when not that, at least the human ideal. But for your living and for your being healed and for your healing, you must never malpractice another, even as you would not be malpracticed. And it is a malpractice, it is a direct malpractice to see in another anything other than the qualities of God. That is their true identity. Even when to human sense they're not manifesting it and even when they don't want to manifest it. Nevertheless, as far as you're concerned, that is their true identity. Now, even when you behold forms of error appearing as human beings, whether in the form of sickness or of sin or of lack. Always remember this. In order to be helpful, and this is expected of you, whether or not they ask for help, please recognize that whatever it is of an erroneous nature that they're manifesting, has its seat, not in them, in this impersonal impersonal 
mortal mind, impersonal carnal mind, impersonal devil, impersonal Satan, any word you like. As long as you recognize it to be an impersonal source. And therefore, having nothing whatsoever to do with the individual who is manifesting it at any particular moment. Now, if you make the mistake of going back to some other form of metaphysical work or treatment and trying to remove some form of error from your patient or from your relative, you won't succeed. You won't succeed any more now than you did before you found the infinite way. Because there's no more benefit being in the infinite way than there is in any other teaching. The only benefit there is from the message of the infinite way is the practice you make of its principles. That's why it would be no good to have an organization and take you all in as members. It wouldn't do a thing for you except take from you some of your inherent individuality because you'd be trying to live up to the standards of your neighbor. Now, or depending on uh, your membership or on your regular attendance or your regular contribution, and be assured none of that counts one single bit. One thing alone counts both in spiritual living and in spiritual healing and that is what truth do you know and how true is that truth and how steadfast are you in its application. That's all there is to it. When you are healed by another, by a practitioner or a teacher, remember you have only had a temporary benefit from the developed consciousness of another. You still will have to develop your own consciousness in order to make health a permanent dispensation and in order that you may help others. Try to believe me when I tell you that no one in all of this world ever receives a spiritual blessing or benefit for their own sake. Never. Any spiritual blessing that is ever given to us by the grace of God is for the benefit that it will be to this universe. Of those who have much much will be expected and demanded. Nobody is ever given the grace of God and then given permission to go up and hide in the mountain somewhere with it. No, no. The more of realization that we have, the more activity is given to us through which to put our understanding and our development to the benefit of this world. It is just like the sun never shines just for your garden. Your garden is just incidental to the whole picture. The sun shines for this entire globe. And the rain falls for this globe. And God's love falls for this globe to the saint and to the sinner, to the just and to the unjust. And so it is that when, in any way, we are given one grain of spiritual understanding or grace, it is only in order that we might be a transparency or an instrument through which it must reach others. It doesn't mean that we should have another generation of uh, practitioners sitting in offices, but it does mean 
that everyone who receives God's grace in a spiritual way should be prepared to help all those who come within range of their consciousness. Now you can see why if you have not, if you've been studying this message and have not found the answers to your problems, you can see in the, just the range of this one tape a probable reason. Somewhere you have not understood the nature of God and therefore have been wasting a lot of time trying to influence God in your behalf or you have not understood correctly the nature of error and you have been battling it or fighting it or trying to overcome it or trying to use the power of God upon it and it won't work it won't work you must bring yourself and you won't find it easy but you must bring yourself to a place in consciousness where you can agree that the Lord is my shepherd and therefore I shall not want and actually know and understand that it is that way and therefore you don't have to pray and plead and implore and affirm the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want and that's it period at some time you must come to the consciousness that he leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And even if I do walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Sometime or other, as infinite way students, you must come to the full and complete demonstration of that 23rd Psalm. And certainly you have it in our booklet in such a form that it makes it easy to relax and rest in it. And then you have to be able to look out of your eyes and even if you see Judas Iscariot say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Even if you are looking at disease, you have to be able to do as Jesus did, what did hinder you? What power is there in that disease? Rise, pick up your bed and walk. You have to be able to see the nothingness, the non-power of that which appearances say is terrifying. In other words, it's a complete change of consciousness. It's a surrendering of the Adam man who believes in two powers, the power of good and the power of evil, and therefore has to earn his living by the sweat of his brow, or has to get healed the hard way. But the true understanding of that first Adam who knew God alone is power, also perceives that whatever it is that appears in the form of sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, any of these and the infinite forms and varieties of them, place it back where it belongs in that impersonal source and then realize since you weren't God created or God ordained, there is no law of God to support you and walk away from it. And as you persist in it, you will develop that state of consciousness which is included in the Master's two commandments. Love the Lord thy God to such an extent that you don't believe God has ever empowered evil. Acknowledge that God is of such infinite power of good that no other power could have existence. 
and then take the next step and realize that your neighbor is the full and complete embodiment of the Christ and only of the Christ qualities and uh, any other appearances really belongs back to that impersonal source which we are continuously nothingizing. And that, you see, is uh, the entire story of our healing work. Almost wonder why we have to have a class. I don't know myself at the moment. And if it turns out that we have had the class and this is it, we'll spend the week together with an aloha of some kind. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.